This is the Edexcel A Level Further Maths Paper 3 from the October 2021 series. And in this paper, we will be taking a look at the Further Mechanics 1 FM1 paper. Question number one. A van of mass 900 kilograms is moving along a straight horizontal road. At the instant when the speed of the van is V meters per second, the resistance to the motion of the van is modelled as a force of magnitude 500 plus 7V newtons. When the engine of the van is working at a constant rate of 18 kilowatts, the van is moving along the road at a constant speed V meters per second. For part A, we have to find the value of V. To do this question, it will be a good idea to draw a diagram. Here is our van. We have a forward driving force of F. We have a resistive force of 500 plus 7V. We need to find the value of V. We know that the sum of the forces is equal to the mass multiplied by the acceleration. Now, because we are traveling at constant speed, the acceleration is equal to zero. So we have F going forward. Opposing that, we have 500 plus 7V, and this is all equal to zero. Let's call this equation one. We also know we are working at a constant rate of 18 kilowatts. And using the fact that power is equal to the driving force F multiplied by V, we have the power 18 kilowatts, or in other words, 18,000 watts. This is equal to the force multiplied by V. And so therefore, you can see F is equal to 18,000 divided by V. Let's call this equation 2. And what we will do is substitute equation 2 into equation 1, replacing the F with 18,000 over V. And so if we substitute in equation 2 into equation 1, we have F 18,000 over V minus 500 plus 7V. This is all equal to zero. If I multiply through by V and expand the minus one into the bracket, we have 18,000 minus 500 V minus 7 V squared. This is all equal to zero. And so we can solve this quadratic to find two values of V. If we use our calculator, we have minus 7V squared minus 500V plus 18,000. This is all equal to zero. So V is either equal to 26.309 etc. Or we have minus 97.737 etc. 
And so our only value of V will be 26.3 given to three significant figures. Now for part B, later on the van is moving up a straight road that is inclined to the horizontal at an angle alpha where sine alpha is equal to 1 over 21. At the instant when the van, when the speed of the van is v meters per second, the resistance to the motion of the van from non-gravitational forces is modelled as a force of magnitude 500 plus 7 v newtons. The engine of the van is again working at a constant rate of 18 kilowatts. We have to find the acceleration of the van at the instant when v equals 15. Before we do anything else, I think it will be a good idea to draw a diagram to help illustrate what's going on. Here is a diagram to help illustrate what's going on. We are going up this hill. We've got a forward driving force of D. The resistance will be 500 plus 7V. And we've also got the weight of the van 900 g this angle alpha angle theta rather where sine theta is 1 over 21 now before we do anything else we're working at a rate of 18 kilowatts so we know already the power is equal to the driving force d multiplied by v so we have 18,000 equals D multiplied by 15, from which we can conclude D is equal to 1,200. Now we need to find the acceleration. We can find the acceleration by using Newton's second law. The sum of the forces is equal to the mass multiplied by the acceleration. So we have D minus the component of the weight parallel to the slope, which is 900 G sine theta minus the resistive force 500 plus 7V. And this is equal to the mass, 900, multiplied by the acceleration. And substituting our value for D, which we found to be 1200, we have 1200 minus 900 G times by 1 over 21 minus 500 plus 7 times by 15. This is equal to 900A. So if we tidy up the left hand side, we have 1200 minus 900 times 9.8 times 1 over 21 minus 500 times 7 times 15 it turns out we get 175 equals 900 a so if I divide this by 900 I get 0.194 the acceleration. So the acceleration is equal to 0 0.194 meters per second squared given to three significant figures. Question number two. Two particles A and B are moving in opposite directions along the same straight line on a smooth horizontal surface when they collide directly. Particle A has 
mass 5m and particle b has mass 3m, the coefficient of restitution between a and b is e, where e is greater than 0. Immediately after the collision, the speed of a is v and the speed of b is 2v. Given that a and b are moving in the same direction after the collision, we have to find the set of possible values of e. Let's begin with the diagram. We've got our particles A and B of masses 5m and 3m respectively. Before they collide, they are moving towards each other. We don't know what the speeds are. I've said the speed of A is x and the speed of y and the speed of B is y. They are moving towards each other, hence the arrows are pointing towards each other. After the collision, they move in the same direction with speeds v and 2v. What we need to do is find the range of values for e. Let's begin by using conservation of linear momentum. We have 5m multiplied by x plus 3m multiplied by minus y. This is equal to 5m lots of v plus 3m lots of 2v. And if we tidy all of this up, we can see that 5x minus 3y is equal to 11v. We'll call this equation 1. And if we use Newton's law of restitution, we know through Newton's law of restitution that e is equal to the speed of separation of the speed of approach. So at the speed at which they are separating, we've got 2v minus v. So e equals 2v minus v. And then the speed of approach well, we've got x minus minus y. So we will divide this by x minus minus y. And so what we can see here then is e is equal to v over x plus y. And so therefore, we can conclude v is equal to ex plus ey. We'll call this equation 2. We need to find out what x and y are before we do anything else. Now, to do that, we can solve them simultaneously. I've got equation one over here, and I've got equation two over here. Now what I want to do is get the coefficient of y is the same, ignoring any signs for now. So if I multiply equation one by e, doing that we have 5ex minus 3ey equals 11. EV. I will call this equation number 3. And if I multiply equation 2 by 3, we have 3EX plus 3EY equals 3V. I will call this equation 4. And now let's add together equation 3 and equation 4. 5ex plus 3ex is 8ex minus 3y plus 3ey, that's 0ey. And this is equal to 11 ev plus 3v 
And if I solve for x, well, on the right-hand side, we can factorize out a v. And if I divide through by 8e, we can therefore conclude x is equal to v over 8e lots of 11e plus 3. So I will call this equation 5. And now we need to find out what y is. To find out what y is, I will use equation 2. So I will substitute in equation 5 into equation 2. Now I know what equation 5 is. That's this result here. Equation 2 is here. So I have v equals e multiplied by v over 8e lots of 11e plus 3 plus an extra ey. I now need to find out what y is. Well, the e's here cancel. So I'm left with v equals v over 8 lots of 11e plus 3 plus ey. So ey is equal to v minus v over 8 lots of 11e plus 3. And now if I expand the minus v over 8 into the bracket, we have ey equals v minus 11ve over 8 minus 3v over 8. So ey is equal to 5v over 8 minus 11v over 8 rather minus 11v e over 8 and so if I factorize out a v over 8 we can then and divide through by e we can therefore conclude y is equal to v over 8e lots of 5 minus 11e. Let's call this equation 6. Now, we also know that e is greater than 0. And so if that's the case, E being greater than zero would imply that X is greater than zero. And if we take a look at what X is, that's 11E plus three. So if X is greater than zero, it follows from here then that Y is going to be greater than zero and so therefore solving the inequality v over 8v lots of 5 minus 11e is greater than zero you can see 5 minus 11e will be greater than zero and so therefore, E will be less than 5 over 11. And if that's the case, the range of possible values for E, we have 0 being less than E, which is less than 5 over 11. Now, given also that the kinetic energy of air immediately after the collision 
is 16% of the kinetic energy of A immediately before the collision, we have to find for the first part of part B the value of E. So, for the first part of part B, we've got the kinetic energy after, which is equal to one half lots of the mass, 5m, lots of v squared. This is equal to 16 over 100, because we've got 16%, lots of one half, lots of 5m, lots of the speed before, which is x squared. Now, if I tidy this up a little, first of all, the 5m's cancel on both sides, and so do the 1 halves. So we have v squared equals 16 over 100 lots of x squared. But we know what x is. x we have found over here. And so we have v squared equals 16 over 100 lots of x squared. Now x squared is v squared over 64 e squared lots of 11e plus 3 all squared. Now 16 over 100 times by 1 over 64, that's 1 over 400, and recognising that the v squareds cancel on both sides, we have 1 equals 1 over 400 e squared, lots of 11e plus 3 all squared. So if I multiply through by 400, e squared, this is equal to, well, 11e plus 3 all squared is 121 e squared plus 66 e plus 9. And if I tidy everything up, I have 279 e squared minus 66 e minus 9 equals 0. So we have 3e minus 1, lots of 31e plus 3 equals 0. So e is either equal to 1 third or e is equal to minus 3 over 31. So therefore e is equal to one third only. This is our only solution. So now for the next part, we have to find the magnitude of the impulse. So the magnitude of the impulse, this will equal the magnitude of the mass 5m lots of v minus x. So, the magnitude of this with e equaling one third, we have 5m multiplied by v minus well, we know what x is, that's given by the result here, so we subtract v over 8v, now we know what 
V over 80, and we know what A is, that's one third. So they've got 8 times by one third. Lots of 11 times by one third plus 3. So we want the magnitude of all this. 1 minus 1 over 8 times by a third. Lots of 11 times 1 third. Plus 3. That's minus 3 over 2. We're multiplying that by minus 5m. So we have the magnitude of minus 5 minus 5m by the minus 15 because we've got 5m times by minus 3 over 2 and then we're multiplying that by v so we've got minus 5 minus 15 mv over 2 the absolute value of this is quite simply 15 mv over 2. In this question, I injure a perpendicular unit vectors in a horizontal plane. A smooth uniform sphere P has mass 0.3 kilograms. Another smooth uniform sphere Q with the same radius as P has mass 0.5 kilograms. The spheres are moving on a smooth horizontal surface when they collide obliquely. Immediately before the collision, the velocity of P is ui plus 2j meters per second, where u is a positive constant, and the velocity of Q is minus 4i plus 3j meters per second. At the instant when the spheres collide, the line joining their centers is parallel to i, the coefficient of restitution between p and q is 3 fifths. As a result of the collision, the direction of motion of p is deflected through an angle of 90 degrees, and the direction of motion of q is deflected through an angle of alpha. For part a, we have to find the value of u. So here is a diagram of everything we know so far. We've got p with mass 0.3 kilograms and Q with mass 0.5 kilograms. The line of center is parallel to I and we've got this common tangent when they collide. Let's now add on the velocities. We've got the initial velocity of P being the U I plus 2j and then we have it being deflected through an angle of 90 degrees so if I deflect it through an angle of 90 degrees we have some velocity will be lambda i but the j component parallel to the common tangent, will not change. So we have lambda i plus 2j. And crucially, the angle in between them is 90 degrees. So we've got 90 degrees over here and then we've got Q well velocity of that before will be given by minus 4 I plus 3 J and then is deflected through an angle of alpha and the resulting velocity
will be wi plus 3j. We don't know what w is, but what we do know is the j component will remain the same. And so, if it's deflected, if p is deflected through an angle of 90 degrees, that means the dot product will be 0. So, we have u i plus 2 j dot product with lambda i plus 2 j equaling 0. The reason for this we have a deflection by 90 degrees. And so, we've got u dot with ui plus 2j dot with lambda i plus 2j, u times by lambda, well that's lambda u, 2 times by 2, that's 4. The result of this is 0. And so we can conclude from here, Lambda is equal to minus 4 over u. So we know what this is over here. Let's just add it to our diagram. This is the same as minus 4 over ui. plus 2j. So that's what lambda is. And so what we can all use is the conservation of linear momentum parallel to the line of centers. So if I do that, we have u multiplied by 0.3 plus minus 4 over u R rather um, let me add on minus 4 lots of 0 0.5 this is equal to minus 4 over u lots of 0.3 plus, well here I'm going to have 0 0.5 times by 3 then, rather 0 0.5 times by w, we're parallel to the line of centers, so then I add on w, lots of 0 0.5, and so if I simplify all this, we have 0.3u, minus 2 equals minus 1.2 over u plus 0.5 w. And if I further simplify this, multiplying through by 10, and then everything with a u on one side, everything not a u on the other side, we have 3u plus 12 over u equals 20 plus 5w. I'm going to call this equation 1. And now we can use Newton's law of restitution. Of course, with Newton's law of restitution, E is equal to the speed of separation of the speed of approach. So I've got E equals the speed of separation. If I go back to my diagram, that's going to be W minus minus 4 over U. So I've got W minus minus 4 over U. And then I'm going to divide this by the speed of approach, which is going to be u minus minus 4. 
So the speed of approach is u minus minus 4. Now, if I go back to the question, I know that the coefficient of restitution between p and q is 3 fifths. And so what we have then is 3 over 5 equals w plus 4 over u over u plus 4. So tidying this up even further, we have 3 over 5, lots of u plus 4, equals w plus 4 over u. And now simplifying all of this, we can conclude we have 20 over u, so I'm just multiplying through by 5, plus 5w, this is equal to 3u plus 12. Let's call this equation 2. And now I can solve equation 1, which is here, and equation 2 simultaneously. Now, because the we have the same number of u's, we've got a 3u here and a 3u here, we can subtract the equations. And so if I subtract the equations, let's do equation 1, take away equation 2. Well, I have 3u plus 12 over u minus 3u minus 12. So that's going to be 12 over u minus 12. And on the other side, we have 20 Well, I'll just make sure I'm doing this right. So 3u minus 3u is 0u. Then we've got 12u, 12 over u minus 12. And then here we've got 20 minus 20 over u. And then the 5w minus the 5w gives 0. And so if I tidy all of this up, I've, I have 32 over u equals 32. So therefore, u equals 1. And knowing that u is equal to 1, we can now find out what w is. Let's substitute into either equation. I'm going to be substituting into equation 2. So I've got 20 over 1 plus 5w. This is equal to 3 lots of 1 plus 12. 15 minus 20 is minus 5. So 5w equals minus 5. w equals minus 1. So I know what u is and I know what w is. And now we have to find the value of alpha. Well, knowing what w is, I can use this information to say that the speed of q after will be minus i plus 3j. And to find out the deflection, we can find out the the angle in between those vectors. Perhaps if I draw this out, we have the vector here, which is minus 4i plus 3j and then we are dot producting this with 
this vector, which we know is minus i plus 3j, so we can find out the angle in between those, the required angle will be alpha. Cos alpha is equal to, well, I've got the minus 4i plus the 3j dot product with minus i plus 3j and then I'm going to divide this by minus 4 squared plus 3 squared square rooted multiplied by minus 1 squared plus 3 squared square rooted so I've got minus 4 times minus 1 plus 3 times by 3 and then this is being divided by well over here I've got 4 squared plus 5 plus 3 squared divided at square rooted so that's going to be 5 and then 1 plus 9 is 10 so then here we have the square root of 10 so cos alpha is equal to 13 over 5 root 10 so now we can find out what alpha is the inverse cosine of 13 over 5 root 10 is 34.7 so we've got 34.7 degrees given to three significant figures now for part c we have to state how we have used the fact that p and q have equal radii well the line of center is parallel to the spheres the spheres are moving on so the impulse acts parallel to the surface Question number four. A particle P has mass 0.5 kilograms. It is moving in the XY plane with velocity 8i meters per second when it receives an impulse lambda lots of minus i plus j newton seconds where lambda is a positive constant. The angle between the direction of motion of P immediately before receiving the impulse and the direction of motion of P immediately after receiving the impulse is theta degrees. Immediately after receiving the impulse, P is moving with speed 4 root 10 meters per second. We have to find the value of lambda and the value of theta. Well, if we use the impulse momentum idea, we've got the impulse, which is lambda i, rather minus lambda i, plus lambda j so that's the impulse and this is equal to the mass 0 0.5 lots of the final velocity v minus the initial velocity 8i and so multiplying by 2 we can therefore conclude that v the final velocity is equal to minus 2 lambda plus 8 i plus 2 lambda j so that's what the velocity is and we know that the velocity afterwards has a magnitude of 4 root 10
So, with the magnitude of V equaling 4 times by the square root of 10, we have minus 2 lambda plus 8 squared plus 2 lambda squared and then square rooted this is equal to 4 times by the square root of 10 now if I square both sides we would have minus 2 lambda plus 8 squared plus 2 lambda squared equals the square of 4 root 10 which is 160 expanding the brackets we have 4 lambda squared minus 32 lambda plus 64 plus 4 lambda squared equals 160 8 lambda squared minus 32 lambda minus 96 equals 0 and dividing through by 8 lambda squared minus 4 lambda minus 12 equals 0 so we've got lambda minus 6 lots of lambda plus 2 equals 0 so lambda is either equal to 6 or minus 2 and so therefore lambda is equal to 6 only because lambda is a positive constant now we have to find the value of theta so the value of theta is the angle in between the initial velocity and the final velocity before we do anything else knowing that lambda is equal to 6 we can therefore state what v is we've got minus 2 times by 6 plus 8 so that's minus 4 in the i direction and in the j direction 2 times by 6 that's 12 So we need to find the angle in between those vectors. So if I find out the angle in between those vectors, that will be given by the angle here. We've got u, which is equal to 8i. And then we've got v, which is minus 4i plus 12j. So this is what we need to find the angle in between. So cos theta is equal to 8i, and I'm going to add on 0j just to make it slightly clear dot with minus 4i plus 12j and then I'm going to divide this by eight squared plus zero squared square rooted multiplied by minus 4 squared plus 12 squared square rooted eight times by minus four that's minus well let's just write this down we have eight times minus four plus zero times by 12 on the top 
and on the bottom I've got the square root of 8 squared which is simply 8 and then 4 squared plus 12 squared square rooted is 4 root 10. And so if I tidy this up, we've got minus 32 over 32 root 10. And therefore, if I find out what theta is, theta is equal to minus 1 over the square root of 10 which I'm doing because the minus 32 over the 32 gives minus 1. So the inverse cosine of this is 108 degrees given to the three significant figures. Question number 5. Figure 1 represents the plan view of part of a horizontal floor where AB and BC represent fixed vertical walls with AB perpendicular to BC. A small ball is projected along the floor towards the wall AB. Immediately before hitting the wall AB, the ball is moving with speed v meters per second at an angle theta to AB. The ball hits the wall AB and then hits the wall BC. That's what we see in this diagram. The coefficient of restitution between the ball on the wall AB is a third. The coefficient of restitution between the ball and the wall BC is E. The floor and the walls are modelled as being smooth. The ball is modelled as a particle. The ball loses half of its kinetic energy in the impact with the wall AB and we have to find the exact value of cos theta. Well, I will let the speed in which the particle is approaching BC equal W meters per second and I will let the speed at which the ball leaves BC equal X meters per second. Now before we do anything else we need to resolve parallel and perpendicular to AB. So, parallel to AB after the first collision. Well, if I say that this angle here is alpha, well, let's do this in a different color. Let's suppose this angle is alpha, then this angle will be 90 minus alpha and if I say that the angle here is beta then parallel to AB after the first collision resolving parallel we have W cos alpha so that's this component here that will equal what it's approaching at, V cos theta. We'll leave that alone. Now, perpendicular to AB after the first collision, we have W sine alpha, which is the vertical component. So W sine alpha, that's equal to E multiplied by V sine theta. We know what E is, that's one third. So we have W sine alpha equals one third V sine theta. Now what we need to do 
is find out what W is. And if we find out what W is, we can use the ideas on kinetic energy to help us find out what cos theta is. So if I call this equation 1, and if I call this equation 2, squaring equation 1 and squaring equation 2 and then adding them together, we have W squared cos squared alpha plus W squared sine squared alpha. Well, if I square V cos theta, I end up with V squared cos squared theta. And then if I square one third V sine theta, I end up with one ninth V squared sine squared theta. W squared cos squared plus W squared sine squared. Well, cos squared plus sine squared is one. So I end up with W squared times by one. That's equal to V squared lots of cos squared plus one ninth sine squared. Now, if we use the ideas on kinetic energy, we are told the ball loses half of its kinetic energy in the impact with the wall AB. So that means half of the initial kinetic energy will equal the kinetic energy at the end because it loses half. So we have one half and this comes from the fact that the ball loses half of its kinetic energy in the first impact with the wall AB. And then we have one half m v squared, and this will equal one half m w squared. Now the half m's cancel out. So we are left with one half the m's cancel out as well, so we've got one half v squared equals w squared. Now w squared that will equal v squared lots of cos squared plus a ninth sine squared. Now here the v squareds cancel out. Perhaps if I write the half over here. With the v squareds cancelling out, I'm left with one half equals cos squared theta plus one ninth sine squared. Now, sine squared is the same as one minus cos squared. So if I expand and simplify, I've got one half equals cos squared plus one ninth minus one ninth cos squared. And so cos squared is equal to seven over 16, from which we can conclude the exact value of cos squared rather the exact value of cos theta will equal the square root of seven divided by four. So we have found what cos theta is. And then the ball loses half of its remaining kinetic energy in the impact with the wall BC 
and we have to find the exact value of a. Well, we need to resolve parallel and perpendicular to the wall BC. And this is for the second collision. So, if I resolve parallel to BC after the second collision, well, let's go back here. What we have is x cos beta, so that's this component here, that will equal w cos of 90 minus alpha. So, we have x cos beta equaling w cos of 90 minus alpha. Now, cos of 90 minus alpha, that's just sine of alpha. So, we've got x times by cos beta equals w lots of sine alpha. Now, do we know what w sine alpha is? We know that w sine alpha is equal to one third lots of v sine theta. Now, the reason I want to get everything in terms of theta is because I do know what cos theta is, and that will help me find out what e is. So that will help us in the sense that x cos beta will equal one third times by v times by sine theta. Now, if I resolve perpendicular to BC after the second collision, well, I would have x sine beta equaling the coefficient of restitution, E, lots of the sine of 90 minus alpha. So, I have x lots of sine beta equaling E lots of W sine of 90 minus alpha. Now, the sine of 90 minus alpha is the same as cos alpha. So I've got E W cos alpha equaling x times by sine beta. Now, do I know what W cos alpha is? Well, W cos alpha, I already worked out previously over here. We found that to equal V cos theta. So, we have X sine beta equals E lots of V cos theta. So, let's call this equation 3, and let's call this equation 4. We can now find out what E is. Well, if I square those, then I would have x squared cos squared beta plus x squared sine squared beta. That will equal, well, x cos beta all squared. If I square this, I'll end up with one ninth v squared sine squared theta. And then if I square ev cos theta, I end up with e squared v squared cos squared theta. So, if I use the statement in the question, the ball loses half of its remaining kinetic energy in the impact with the wall BC. From that, we can say that one half, so this one half, comes from the fact that the ball loses half of its remaining kinetic energy in the impact with the wall BC. We've got one half 
lots of the one half times one half m v squared. So this was the first bit. And this will equal one half m x squared, the final kinetic energy. So with the one halves cancelling of both sides and a half times a half equaling a quarter. Well, before we do anything else, what we can say then is one quarter would equal, well, one quarter v squared would equal one half. Uh, rather the half is cancelled, so x squared, that's this result here. Perhaps if I just clarify that. x squared cos squared plus x squared sine squared, that will just be x squared, and that will equal this over here. So what we can do now is simplify this even further. So with the v squareds cancelling out, I've got one quarter equals one ninth sine squared plus e squared cos squared. And recognising that sine squared is equal to 1 minus cos squared. I've got 1 quarter equals 1 ninth lots of 1 minus cos squared plus e squared cos squared. Now I wonder what cos squared is. Cos squared I found that to be root 7 over 4 so cos squared is 7 over 16. So we're going to be using cos squared equals 7 over 16 in this question. So if we replace as necessary, we have 1 quarter equals 1 ninth, lots of 1 minus 7 over 16, plus e squared, lots of 7 over 16, where cos squared is 7 over 16. So, if I work out what e squared is, well, I have 1 quarter minus 1 ninth, lots of 1 minus 7 over 16, which is 3 over 16. And then if I divide this by 7 over 16, I get 3 sevenths. So e squared is 3 sevenths, from which we can conclude e is equal to 3 over 7 square rooted. This is the exact value of e. Question number 6. A light elastic spring has natural length 3L and modulus of elasticity 3mg. One end of the spring is attached to a fixed point X on a rough inclined plane. The other end of the spring is attached to a package P of mass M. The plane is inclined to the horizontal at an angle alpha, where tan alpha equals 3 quarters. And if that's the case, forming a right angle triangle with a hypotenuse equaling 5, found through Pythagoras, sine alpha is 3 fifths cos alpha is 4 fifths and given tan alpha is 3 quarters. The package is initially held at the point y on the plane where x, y is equal to L. Now if it's got a natural length of L, we are compressing this package. Rather we are compressing the spring. So 
This statement would suggest we have compression. Now, the point y is higher than x and xy is a line of greater slope of the plane as we see in figure 2. The coefficient of friction between p and the plane is a third. By modelling p as a particle, for part a we have to show that the acceleration of p at the instant when p is released from rest is 17 over 15 g. Now, what we'll do to begin with is amend our free body diagram. So, we've got the thrust of the spring, we'll call this thrust T. We've got the friction opposing it, we'll call this frictional force F. We've got the weight going down. Weight is mg. We have the reaction force R. Now, before we do anything else, let's find out what R is. From that, we can find out what F is. So, if I resolve perpendicular to the plane. We have R, which is equal to mg cos alpha. And we know what cos alpha is. Cos alpha is 4 fifths. And so therefore, we can conclude R is equal to 4 mg over 5. And using the fact that F is equal to mu r. F is equal to one third, which is the coefficient of friction, multiplied by r, which is 4 mg over 5. So from this, we can conclude that F is equal to 4 mg over 15. So that's what F is. Now, we can now find out what T is, the thrust T, that's equal to, well, we've got the modulus of elasticity, which is 3mg, multiplied by the extension. Now, the extension here will be 2L. The reason it's 2L is because it's got, well, not the extension, the compression length is going to equal 2L because we've got a natural length of 3L. It's held at the point Y, where XY is L, so 3L take away L is 2L. And then we divide all of this by the natural length, which is 3L. So therefore, the thrust T is equal to 2 mg L. The L's cancel out, so we are just left with 3, 2 mg. Now we need to use Newton's second law, which tells us that the sum of the forces is equal to the mass times the acceleration. So if I use that, I've got T, and then I've got opposing that the friction force and the component of the weight parallel to the plane. So I've got T minus F minus mg sine alpha. This is equal to the mass m multiplied by the acceleration. Now I know what T is, that's 2mg. I know what F is. F is 4mg over 15. And I know what sine alpha is, that's 3 fifths, so I'm going to subtract 3mg over 5. And this is equal to the mass times by the acceleration. So from this, I can find out what the required acceleration is. 
with the M's cancelling, I've got 2 minus 4 fifteenths minus 3 fifths, which is 17 over 5, rather 17 over 15. So I have 17 G over 15 meters per second squared as my acceleration. Now, for part B, we have to find, in terms of G and L, the speed of P at the instant when the spring first reaches its natural length of 3L. So what we want to do is find out the speed over here. That's our objective. And the distance is going to be given by 3L. So with that information, what we can do is use the work energy principle. Initially, we have rather we want to find out this total. We want to find the speed over here. So the distance it travels, that distance we can find quite easily. Here we would have 2L and Using energy, we've got initial EPE here, and that's all we've got. If I take this point Y to be the zero level, using energy, we have the initial EPE, which is equal to, well, I've got the modulus of elasticity, 3mg, multiplied by extension squared, so I've got 2L squared, divided by two lots of 3L, which is twice the natural length. So the initial EPE is equal to 2MGL. And then the final EPE will be zero. But then we've also got gravitational potential energy at this point here because it's got some elevation. So we've got the length 2L sine alpha multiplied by the weight mg. So we've got 2L times by sine alpha multiplied by mg. So I've got 2L times by 3 fifths, which is what sine alpha is, multiplied by mg. So I get 6 mgl over 5. Now, also at that point, it's got kinetic energy. It starts from rest, so there's no initial kinetic energy. So the final kinetic energy will be given by 1 half mv squared. Now, the plane is rough, so what we can do is find out the, the work done against friction. That's going to equal the force times by the distance it travels, which is 2L. So the reason it travels 2L is because we are going from here to here, which is a distance of 2L. Now I know what F is as well, that's 4mg over 15. So I've got 4mg over 15 times by 2L, which is equal to 8mgL over 15. We can now use the work energy principle. 
we've got our initial EPE 2MGL minus our final GPE, which is 6MGL over 5 minus the final kinetic energy, which is 1 half mv squared. And this is equal to the work done against friction, 8 mgl over 15. Now, happily for us, the m's cancel. So if I rearrange, I've got 1 half v squared equals 2 gl minus 6 gl over 5 minus 8 gl over 15. So I can find out what v squared is by rearranging. Let's see what we have in total here. We've got 2 minus 6 over 5 minus 8 over 15. That's 4 over 15. So we have v squared equals and then if I multiply that by the 2 to get rid of the half, I get 8 over 15. So I have v squared equals 4mgl over 15, rather 8. And so therefore I can state what v is. v is equal to 8 mgl over 15 divided by the square root of uh, the square root of 8 mgl over 15. So that is our rather there is no m here. So I'd, I am just left with. V equaling 8GL over 15. Question number 7. In this question, I and J are perpendicular unit vectors in a horizontal plane. Figure 3 represents the plan view of part of a smooth horizontal floor where AB is a fixed smooth vertical wall. The direction of AB is in the direction of the vector i plus j. A small ball of mass 0.25 kilograms is moving on the floor when it strikes the wall AB. Immediately before its impact with the wall AB, the velocity of the ball is 8i plus 2j meters per second. Immediately after its impact with the wall AB, the velocity of the ball is v meters per second. The coefficient of restitution between the ball and the wall is a third. By modeling the ball as a particle, for part A, we have to show that V equals 4i plus 6j. Well, given this information about the direction of AB, the unit vector parallel to AB is i plus j over the square root of 2, and a unit vector perpendicular to AB will be minus i plus j over the square root of 2. So that is going in this direction, and the perpendicular one is going in that direction. Now, why do I care about that? Well, what I can do is find out, with that information, what this is going this way. And I can also find out the vertical component too. And that's why I'm interested in the vectors parallel to AB and perpendicular to AB, because I can then find out the components of V. So, with that, if I resolve parallel, if I resolve parallel to AB, well, it's moving towards the wall with speed 8i plus 2j. So parallel to AB, we would have
the unit normal vector, which is this here, and then we will dot product this with a tie plus 2j. And then, I'm going to multiply this scalar value by this normal vector. And what that will tell me is this vector here. So, working that out, I have, well, the root 2 over root 2, that's just going to be, um, well, let's just work this out properly. Here I have 1. Well, let's just write this down. I have 1 times by 8 plus 1 times by 2 divided by root 2 being multiplied by this unit vector parallel to AB. So I've got 8 plus 2 which is 10. I've got 10 over the square root of 2 times the square root of 2 so that's just going to be 5. So what I've got here is 5i plus 5j and that I've worked out is what this is 5i plus 5j so that's the velocity parallel to AB after the collision and then if I resolve perpendicular to AB Well, I've got minus one third, and the reason I've got a minus is because it's in the opposite direction. We go, we're going this way over here, that's why I need the minus. And then, similar idea to what I had here, I need to multiply the dot product of ai plus 2j, which is a velocity before, by this unit vector perpendicular to ab, and then I multiply that by that unit vector, similar to what I did here. The only difference this time, perpendicular, we need to use the Newton's law of restitution. So, I have this unit normal vector over here, multiplied by AI plus 2J and then multiply this by that normal vector. So what do I get over here? Well, I have minus one third multiplied by minus 1 times by 8 plus 1 times by 2 divided by root 2 and then this is going to be multiplied by this normal unit normal vector so I've got minus 8 plus 2 which is minus 6. Dividing that by 3, I get minus 3. Um, well, let's just work that out properly. I've got minus 6 on the top, and on the bottom, I've got 3 
root 2. And then I'm going to multiply that by... Well, here on the bottom I've got a minus 3 root 2 because I've got the minus here. So this entire thing is root 2. And then I'm dividing that by root 2, so that's just going to be 1. So therefore here, I get minus i plus j. So here I have minus i plus j. And from this I can find out what v is. v will equal 5i plus 5j plus minus i plus j so therefore v will equal well here I've got 5 minus 1 which is 4 so I've got 4i and then 5 plus 1 that's 6 so I've got 4i plus 6j now for part b, we have to find the magnitude of the impulse received by the ball in the first impact. Well, for part b, i is equal to the mass, 0 0.25, multiplied by v minus u. So I've got 0 0.25, lots of v which is, well, let's just do this in big brackets. I've got V, which is 4i plus 6j, minus u, which is the ai plus 2j, so this is what the vector u is. So I'm going to subtract. 8i plus 2j so I've got 0 0.25 lots of, well 4i minus 8i, that's minus 4i and then 6i minus 2 sorry, 6j minus 2j that's 4j so I'm multiplying this by 0 0.25 so I get minus i plus j and so therefore, the magnitude of the impulse is given by minus 1 squared plus 1 squared square rooted. So I end up with the square root of 2 newton seconds as the magnitude of the impulse.